On October 3rd, 1985, Michigan State Trooper David Hare was only an hour away from the end of his shift. But on this day, David would not be able to serve out his time uneventfully. Instead, he was forced to watch as a freak accident on a road outside Northville, Michigan, changed the lives it touched forever. When a train is coming to a crossing, signals, lights, and guardrails are triggered to warn everyone to get off the tracks before hundreds of tons of steel roll through. The result of death is much higher with these than any other type of land accident. The comparative weight of a train and a car, there's just no match. The train itself weighs as much as 200 automobiles, so there's, the, the engineer actually feels nothing when he, when he hits a car. Around two in the afternoon, George and Celine Jokic were driving west on Seven Mile Road on their way to lunch. At the same time, two runaway boxcars were heading downhill towards Seven Mile Crossing. State Trooper David Hare was driving east toward the same crossing. You got the right to remain silent. Why don't you exercise that right? I was returning to the Northville Post for the prisoner I had made an arrest for, a larceny and some selling of narcotics at a high school. As I approached the tracks, there was a vehicle in front of me, a lady in it that was going relatively slow. My thoughts at the time were, hurry up, hurry up, because I had an hour left in my shift before I started a four-day weekend. There was no warning of the approaching boxcars. I was just about to cross the tracks, and I didn't even notice or pay much attention to the vehicles approaching me coming from the other direction. All at once, I saw something as large as a house. Check it out. And I remember thinking that there's no way anybody's going to be alive in that car. Dom Kelly saw the collision from her van. The boxcar came through the intersection. The blinking lights didn't flash. The gates didn't come down. I knew right away that the person who was sitting on the passenger side was going to be hurt. Twenty one sixteen to one. We got a serious car train accident, seven mile in Northville. There's still a south one on the tracks, there's two box cars and one vehicle. Clear sixteen, Northville Road, six mile. The people in the vehicle were my main concern. If anybody was alive, what kind of condition they were in, uh, stopping the things so we could get them out. The only thing I could think of was the brake wheel and the box car. I put my foot to the floor. My intention was not only to get ahead of the box cars. But a six-mile road, I knew I could get up to the tracks relatively quickly. The bridge at six mile was of great concern to me. The vehicle's not going to fit across that bridge. If it hits the bridge at, at any speed, I have no idea what's going to happen. If it's going to dislodge the vehicle, drop it onto the road underneath the bridge, just derail the boxcars, I have no idea. I was well ahead of the boxcars at this point. They were traveling 40 miles an hour or so when they entered the intersection, and I'm sure were slowing due to the vehicle lodged in the front. When I got into view, I could see an elderly gentleman waving out his driver's window at me. Your mind races a million miles an hour in a situation like that. I remember thinking that if I wait for the end of the second boxcar, it's obviously the safest place to board, but there may not be a brake wheel there. I elected to board between the boxcars, hoping that one car or the other would have a brake wheel. When I made contact with that handrail, it deceived me. That sucker's going a lot faster than I thought.
I could tell that the driver was okay. Uh, physically, he, he appeared to be in good shape. There's no massive bleeding externally or anything at that point. The passenger was critically injured. I ran back to the patrol car, radioed the post, told them that we needed emergency and rescue equipment. Okay, clear 16. We have fire and rescue and wrong. We have a unit around from the post to back up and take care of your prisoner. When David had first run to the boxcars, he had left his prisoner unattended. I knew who he was, and no major thing to find him again. So he was far from being my primary concern at that point. I couldn't see any reason to take him from the vehicle without medical assistance. Uh, just in case, you know, a collision at that speed, you got to have some kind of neck injury. I was reaching down through the windows in order to try to get vital signs on the passenger or render whatever aid I could at that point. There wasn't much I could do at that point. He was ashen, he was in shock. There's no doubt about that. I didn't tell him anything about his wife. I didn't know what to tell him. I didn't see anything. I know you didn't, sir. I didn't either, okay? I didn't see it either. One, okay. I didn't two, see okay. three. Okay, sir. You're all right. Just stay right there. In order to get the passenger out, uh, we had to uh, cut the roof supports on the vehicle and peel the roof somewhat off the car. George Jokic and his wife were taken to the hospital where he was treated and released. Celine died within hours. George and Celine had been married for 43 years. We had a very good life together. We did. We were uh, very fruitful. We had two daughters. Now I have three grandchildren. And uh, she was a very good woman. Four years later, George has made a new life for himself. He's married again to a woman he'd known for years. You've got to realize that there's nothing you can do about death. It's definite. I, I missed my wife, and I, I mourn her go on, going, but I realized nothing can be changed. We just got to go on living. And he and Trooper David Hare have become close friends. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for David Hare. And if that train pushed me any further, I might have went over the, over the bridge at six miles. This guy is full of life, full of fun, full of jokes, full of the devil a lot of the time. In my opinion, it just wasn't his time. You know, you see a poor guy that's it's stuck in a car and he's going sideways down the tracks and he's not going to live a lot longer. He's not going to. The car's being ate up. He's approaching a narrow bridge. I mean, what are you going to do? You know, are you going to stand there and watch it go by and, and hope for the best or and take a shot at it, you know? George has a very different view of what David did. Courageous. Very courageous for what he did. And I'm grateful. I'm very grateful. Because he gave me the opportunity to really, you know, live out my life. Next. I knew.